Exhale. <laughs> ready to hear why you are being called to this court? Indeed, Magistrate. O Andres, Athenaioi, Ethrosmanoi, Nun Hopos, Exitomon, Ton Socrate, Prostas, Catodarias, Hemon, Afrocanine, Kai Asadine, Kai Tutos, Neos, Athenaios, Deacterestai. Right. Citizens of Athens, we are assembled to call Socrates to answer our charges of impiety and corrupting the Athenian youth. And since we are a culture of civilization and rationality, we begin by allowing you, Socrates, to speak to the citizens as you wish. I thank the magistrate and the court. I brought my little guardian angel today, my devon, my demigod, and on the way here, I received no word from my demon, which means to me that today, whatever happens, is going to be a very good day, because there was no warning from a level guy. It was always with me. So let me begin by saying that I hardly recognize myself from some of the charges that have been leveled against me. And I actually fear my accusers from the past far more than Manitas and Miletus who accuse me today. Uh, my accusers from the past have put in your minds ideas, shadows, that uh, I cannot fight against. Let me be more specific as to what I mean. You remember when you watched Sesame Street and the children, you saw that big bird skit uh, portrayed me as a silly old philosopher hanging in the corner of a room, wondering about the things above the earth and beneath the earth. You, you all saw that by his children. And, and in that play uh, by Aristophanes, the comedic uh, playwright, uh, you got an impression of Socrates as a silly old man who wonders about such things. And so let me address that shadow first. Anaxagoras, Anaxagoras was such a metaphysician, that is, one who wonders about reality and things above the earth. But those of you who know me realize this is an absurd charge. For my primary concern in my whole career in Athens has been about human character. I care not about things above the earth or beneath it. I am not a scientist. But I am interested in human soul and human spirit. And that is what I have done. So to be fair to me, you should set aside the shadows from the past and think of me as a philosopher who cares about character, not about silly questions of metaphysics. And I apologize if I address the court today in languages that is not the legalese to which you are accustomed, but I am a trained, I have trained myself as a philosopher, and I can only speak in the dialogue of, of a philosopher, and not in the technical language of the court, and that is the only way that I can address you. Uh, why am I here today, Magistrate? Why am I in this world of seeming trouble? But that darn Cherifon, my, my, my friend, that willful Cherifon, he, he took it upon himself to go up to, to Delphi, to the oracle there. And, and um, he asked the, the, the priestess, is Socrates the wisest of men? And the oracle replied, yes, he is the wisest of men. And when, when Cherifon brought this message back to me, his friend, I, I was baffled. <coughs> absolutely baffled, because I know that I am not wise. Um, and the only thing I could think of was that the, the oracle had posed a riddle to me by a chair uh, a, a riddle, uh, the meaning of the answer to which is that the wisdom of, of, of men, like Socrates, is nothing. OK? 
compared to the wisdom of the gods. Yet still, I was intrigued by the riddle, and I began my quest, a quest that has occupied my adult life, a, a quest that has irritated many of you. And that quest was to go around Athens and to find a man wiser than me. And here I admit of knowing nothing and of being ignorant, and so I wanted to, to check out the, the riddle. Well, I, I went to the poets, and uh, the poets uh, recited their verses, and then I asked them to explain what they meant. And uh, a, 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 a commoner uh, could, could explain the poet's uh, verse better than the poets could. Uh, so the poets exposed themselves as not, as not even knowing about what they were doing as poets. So they could not be wise. And in pointing out that they were not wise, I made them angry. Well, I went to politicians, and I went to judges, and uh, all in the attempt to, to, to seek an answer to the riddle uh, of Delphi. And uh, I, I found them. I found artisans who knew how to make uh, shields and swords, and but they then went from there to speak about their great wisdom of justice and politics and philosophy, things that they knew not, and thereby exposed themselves as knowing, claiming to know things about which they knew nothing. Which is worse, to claim things about which you know nothing, or to admit, as I do, that I know nothing and that I'm not a wise man. So that has been a good deal of, a good cause of, of my trouble here. I have, you know, I'm, I'm feeble in age, so I have uh, a few notes here to my, my, my course. I'm a 70-year-old man, what can you expect? Um, the, oh, the corruption. Of that, of course, is one of the main charges that I'm being accused of here. Corruption of the youth. Um, the, the youth of Athens uh, follow me around the city. And they, they watch me and they listen to me in my dialogues with all the professional people I interview. <coughs> and the, the youth enjoy the spectacle uh, of seeing these, these wise men uh, ridiculed and made fools of. And some of the youth themselves imitate me and go around and do the same thing that I do. But um, I, I have, as a teacher, you have accused me of taking money from my students. Now there are other teachers, the sophists in particular, who have taken money from their students, but I have never taken a single drop from any student. And, and let's speak to the issue of corruption. Let me ask you a question. Maybe Molinus or Anitas can reply. Um, which of the two is better? A good man or a bad man? Someone answer. A good man. A good man. Uh, and here's another question. Which kind of society would you rather live in? Uh, a, society, a society of good men or a society of bad men? Society of good men. All right. Well then, would it be wise of Socrates to corrupt the youth? Would this be in my best self-interest to corrupt the youth? And I say, no. If I were, if I were to corrupt the youth, I would be corrupting those very people that I have to live with, and that wouldn't make any sense. Now, are those are there those in Athens who improve the youth? Yes or no? Yes. There, there, there are. The judge, the magistrates improve the youth. And do not the senators improve the youth? And the lawyers and the priests, do all these people improve the youth. And yet you are saying in your charges that I, Socrates, am the only corrupter of the youth. Can that be true? 
all, all Athenians, all leaders, are doing good things for the youth. And there is one man, myself, who does it all to them. Ridiculous. Impiety. Did I, when I first came into this room, and forgive me for my passionate tone of voice, my life's on the line here. <laughs> Did I not mention my dynamo, my, my demigod? All right. I, 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 I shared with you my faith in my demigod. But where do demigods come from? Demigods are the offspring of bigger gods. And those bigger gods, the offspring of larger gods, the largest of whom being Zeus itself. So if I believe in this God, by implication and logical necessity, I believe in God. Ridiculous. My mission in life has been to exhibit a character of courage and at the same time, and it does take courage, to practice my craft of philosophy. I fought for Athens at the Battle uh, of Potidae. The generals asked me to stand my ground, and I did, did not flee. Uh, I expressed my personal courage and conviction in the trial of the, the admirals who were falsely accused of murdering their men in the, the naval disaster at uh, Arganusai, which was a, a factor of weather, and I came to the defense of those generals as a matter of character. I am uh, true to my character and true to my values, and is that an ill, is that an evil? I argue not. And my mission has also been to philosophize. Oh, I've gone over time, haven't I? Well, I allowed you a little extra time because of getting called into, but yes, you must now prepare yourself to complete your remarks. and. Uh, let, let me cut to the chase, so to speak. I have been, as you know, a gadfly. You know what a horsefly is? What what a horsefly is persistent. That's why we hate horseflies. They never quit nagging, bothering, irritating, buzzing, biting us. I have been an, a horsefly on the ass of Athens. And you have not liked that. But all the time, that gadfly has been trying to tell you that there is a better way to live. There is a better way to act. That's what the gadfly, Socrates, has been trying to tell you all these years. And if you kill me, you will rule the day. Because there will be no other to take my place. I rest. Will the first prosecution team please come forward and be placed before the assembly? Then we have three to five minutes. All right, fellow Athenians, we gathered here today for the uh, trial of Socrates hold him accountable for two charges. He went through them. He brought us to God. He shows his faith. But he jeopardizes the entire polis with his teachings and his beliefs in other gods. He comes claiming he has faith in this one that he spoke to him today. But no no mishaps, no misfortunes, but let us stand here and rethink that. Now, now our second charge, we'd like to press on him corruption of the youth and his teachings to the youth. He claims, he teaches a better way of thinking, that there's a better life than being that fly on the ass of Athens. What he's done is corrupt a thinking that has helped us buy as a society, as a whole. And he comes 
misguiding our youth, telling them different ways, different things. So, Socrates, you talk in circles. <laughs> round and round. And you're a fast talker. You claim you know nothing. But one thing you do know is that you're guilty. <laughs> you sit in front of us today, leave us to decide your fate, and come humbly before the magistrate, the polis, the people of Athens, claim you a fool and claim you guilty for the charges we hold against you. I express my case there. <laughs> Best case, number one, we will come forward. said everything that I was going to say. So, with that in mind, <coughs> pay no mind to the fact that it's going to be a slight bit repetitive. Um, it's only because everything Socrates said was so valid that it's worth repeating. The first thing that I would say is that the charges held against Socrates are impiety and corrupting the Athenian youth. The, that entails in terms of corrupting the Athenian youth teaching obscure things up in the clouds, atheism, and as Socrates says, that we, meaning philosophers, make the worst views appear to be the best. What this defense team is going to argue is that not only does Socrates not teach atheism, but Socrates is not an atheist. Um, as Socrates said in his statements, a, only God is wise. B, that he goes about the world obedient to God. And C, my devotion to God has reduced me to utter poverty. This entails that not only does Socrates believe in a God, but his devotion to God is so powerful that he's willing to do God's will, even if it leads to, potentially, but we're not going to let that happen, <coughs> his death, and complete and utter impoverishment. Um, second, Socrates says, men of, God, men of Athens, I honor and love you, but I must obey God rather than you, and while I have life and strength, I will never stop doing philosophy. So, not only does Socrates believe in God, but the exact actions which you are essentially condemning him for are demonstrative of his devotion to God or some sort of higher power. Finally, you imply that Socrates is preaching and teaching the youth of Athens about demigods. First and foremost, Socrates himself said that he has no interest about things above or beneath the earth as it, as it applies to his philosophy and his work on this earth. Therefore, he has no interest in teaching about demigods to the youth of Athens. Secondly, as we saw, and as Socrates said, if he does believe in demigods, that also means that he believes in some overarching higher power and ultimate god, <coughs> who these gods are demi to. So, that's all.
Shocker to you. He says he's a wise man. He says that he wants to help create a better Athens. But what is that risk? And are you are you going to be ruling our country in the years come when we all die? Well, what kind of country do we want? Do we want a country that respects the government, that is part of society? Or do we want people running around talking about atheism and talking about just everything that's not part of what we've always been trying to teach to our children. We want something that's going to be good for the laws here. Um, he's been corrupting the youth, and he says that in himself he is not corrupted, so why would he not want to corrupt the youth? But he is in himself corrupted, and he does want to get the people of our country and of Athens. Um, the big part of this government is that it will collapse if the laws are not followed. And that's a big thing that Socrates is not doing is following the laws. So do we want our government to collapse? Do we want you to not follow what we've been trying to teach to them all these years? Is that what we want? No, it's not part of Athens. It's not the Athens. It's a new way. Um, so how can you take advice from a man that is questioning advice from him, from somebody who's not even part of our society, we can't accept that as part of Athens. You know, we have to take the moldy piece of bread out before it gets to all the other pieces. <laughs> so. referencing uh, the Apology, which is the written account of his statements. So we start with the accusation, uh, this is quoted, Socrates is an evildoer and a curious person who searches into things under the earth and in heaven, and he makes a, the worse appear the better cause, and he teaches the aforesaid doctrine to others. Now our refutation, Socrates clearly states that he has nothing to do with physical speculations, asking the court if anyone has heard him speak or teach on this subject. And there was silence. As for being a teacher and taking money, although he feels it to be an honorable profession, he is clearly a poor man, which shows that he does not accept any money. And secondly, he merely asks questions of certain individuals and, and nothing else. He's, he doesn't preach to these students that quote unquote students. Um, and as we go to the origin of his quote unquote wisdom, um, as he went into his, his history, uh, an early friend of Socrates, uh, Chirophon, went to the Oracle of Delphi and asked if there was any man wiser than Socrates. Uh, the prophetess answered that there was no man wiser. Chirphone's brother, who is in the court today, uh, will confirm the validity of this statement. And I tell you this so that you may know why Socrates has his current reputation. Uh, when Socrates first heard this news, he questioned the God's meaning, for he knew that he had no wisdom, small or great. Yet he knew that it was stated by the God who could not lie. He then thought of a method to test the question. If only Socrates could find a man wiser than himself. Then he would be able to go to the god with a reputation in hand. Uh, Socrates then spoke with many men who were considered wise and found them to be no wiser than he, making enemies out of the men in question, which I believe is why he is truly here today. 
Ultimately, he found that only God is wise, for man's wisdom is worth nothing, which he stated earlier, stating that Socrates is the wisest, for he knows that his wisdom, and this is quoted, is in truth worth nothing. Therefore, Socrates now travels to find wise men and show them that they are not wise. Socrates states that due to his occupation, he is in utter poverty, as I mentioned prior, by reason of his devotion to God, which refutes the statements that he is an atheist. As you can see, Socrates believes in God and receives no money for his occupation. Um, I'm now going to read a quote uh, from Socrates himself. There's another thing. Young men of the richer classes who have not much to do come about me on their own accord. They like to hear the pretenders ex examine, and they often imitate me and proceed to examine others. There are plenty of persons, as they quickly discover, who think that they know something, but really know little or nothing. And then those who are examined by them instead of being angry with themselves are angry with me. This confounded Socrates, they say, this villainous misleader of the youth. And then, if somebody asks them, why? What evil does he practice or teach? They do not know and cannot tell. But in order that they may not appear to be at a loss, they repeat the ready-made charges which are used against all philosophers about teaching things up in the clouds and under the earth, and having no gods and making the worst appear the better cause. They do not like to confess that their pretense of knowledge has been detected, which is, in fact, the truth. I now go to the second set of accusations, uh, saying that Socrates is an evildoer who corrupts the youth. Our refutation is that after questioning Miletus, Socrates withdrew an irrational statement that proves the unjust nature of this trial. I now read another excerpt. Then every Athenian improves and elevates them, all with the exception of myself, and I alone and their corrupter. Is this what you affirm? Melita states, this is what I stoutly affirm. I am very unfortunate if you are right, but suppose I ask you a question. How about horses? Does one man do them harm and all the world good? Is not the exact opposite the truth? One man is able to do them good, or at least not many. The trainer of horses, that is to say, does them good. And others who have to do with them rather injure them? Is not that true, Miletus, of horses, or of any other animals? Most assuredly, it is. Whether you and Anitas say yes or no, happy indeed would be the condition of youth if they had one corrupter only, and all the rest of the world were their improvers. In addition to the absence of logic in the previous statement, Socrates' corruption of the youth could be unintentional at best, for he was merely carrying out the work sent upon him by the gods, proving that he's not an atheist. Receiving no money, whereby young men followed him on their own accord, making this alleged offense unintentional, and the law has no cognizance of unintentional offenses. And with that, I rest my case. Well, thanks all that we there presented cases against and for the accused. And now, because it's vitally important, ample opportunity to weigh this decision you will be making today have approximately 10 minutes to ask questions of Socrates and me to ask questions of you. As long as order is maintained, I will allow Socrates to freely interact with the assembled citizens. And you may uh, raise your hand and Socrates will acknowledge you. He may speak back to you. And of course, we have the magistrate's staff <coughs> to ensure that order is maintained. I would like to know, in the course of 
your dealings with philosophical ways, did you ever intend to harm anyone, or specifically the youth, our young youth of Athens? Of course not. My whole purpose, as I said, has been a concern over the improvement of the character of all, including the youth. And in my method of dialogue, of asking questions of important people, uh, I felt I was modeling to the youth a, a way of proceeding in life that was, was exemplary and exceptional and, and, and better than uh, simply accepting uh, authority and, and power for its own sake. And you still feel like you're modeling for the youth when you're here, submitting yourself under Athenian law in a charge that might end your life? Absolutely. And I would say I am affirming even more important values by being here today. Some of you have accused me of uh, that I'm suicidal for showing up at this trial. Uh, many, many of you may know that uh, I was offered the opportunity to uh, escape from Athens. Uh, two, two things come to mind. Number one, to do such a thing would be to defy the laws of Athens. And one of the prosecution teams said that I was a breaker of laws. If I was a breaker of laws, I would not be here today. And here I stand before you, facing the music to the movie, uh, responding to your questions and, and, and I will accept the judgment of this charge. So how how in any way could that be conceived of being a, a, a lawbreaker? And as to suicide, what what do we what do we know of death? We we know nothing of death. So for me or for anyone else in this room to fear death is to fear that of which we know nothing. For all we know, death could be either uh, sleep or it could be for me an opportunity to, if there is an afterlife, to meet with others in that afterlife, unjustly accused as I am, and share stories. And to meet with Ajax and to meet with Achilles. So, and Achilles, his mother prophesied. Then he would die in battle. Did he run from the battle? No. He continued the fight until the prophecy was fulfilled. And I have continued my fight for philosophy right down to this day. And truly, I would rather die for philosophy than live without it. The unexamined life is not worth living. Thank you. court, excuse me, magistrate. It Be is careful a, about accusing the court. It is a hidden agenda of this court to find a scapegoat uh, for the for the loss uh, <coughs> Athens has faced in the Peloponnesian War, and my association with the rule of the Thirty, which now is out of power, um, has uh, uh, what. I am guilty by association with this earlier government that is, is no longer in power. You are in power, the 30 are out, and because I was on their side, you accused me. As to the best form of government, there are two kinds of tyranny. There's the 
tyranny of one, and there's the tyranny of the mob. And who's disposed of what you like to put yourself? The tyranny of one or the tyranny of, of a mob who want to tear your throat out? I rest my case. Other comments? Yes. In your apology, why do you state that you're not wise? Because that is a basic assumption of the philosopher. To the philosopher, the questions are more important than the answers. So that when I say that I know nothing, uh, it means I, I know nothing for sure. I know nothing as fact. I, I do know what some of the important questions are, but philosophy is all about the questions, not the answers. So I can plead ignorance and be in full what compliance with, if there are any laws of philosophy, I can be in compliance with the laws of my discipline by emphasizing my ignorance. Uh, humility is the approach of the philosopher to the questions he or she has asked. Socrates, I have two questions for you. The first is, uh, what, what, uh, being a, um, a model of your own lifestyle, that's your, that is the greater cause, what have you, what is apparent that you have obtained as a result of this uh, lifestyle, this greater life, other than poverty and hunger. Isn't this what you're teaching our children to pursue? Um, I have attained nothing material. I stand before you in rags, and my family is, has been impoverished by my quest. But what are the real goods of this life? Are the real goods of this life in material things, in, uh, in, in, in money, in, in wealth, in power, or in pleasure? Are, are these the real goods of life? I would argue no, they're not. The real good in life is found in having a good character. So that is what I offer my students. I offer them a good that is far greater than any material wealth or any position of power or any pleasure on this earth. Secondly, uh, surely the gods are wise. And wouldn't the, uh, the gods have told the Oracle Delphi to, the, 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 the message that sent you on your quest that ultimately led you here? Uh, surely that the, God, the gods are wise, wiser than you, then perhaps you may think that you're sent on a quest to prove something. The gods may have sent you on a quest just to meet this fate. So if I understand what you're saying... Um, we don't know the gods' true intent. If the gods say that Socrates is the wisest man, and if that I should accept that, I um, should accept what the gods say. Yeah. Perhaps the gods knew your reaction, and, and said, gave you that message to send you on a fool's errand to lead you to this fate to be condemned. Oh, the gods would never send one on a fool's errand. If the errand is of the gods, it is a worthy one. <coughs> Unless the intent was to have you killed, then that would then that, If that is the will of the gods, then that is a good thing that I be killed. I invite it. Socrates, um, godliness, uh, isn't it not goodness, a work of goodness? And uh, so how can, how can one show goodness without being godly? So can you, can you tell me how you can be theistic and atheistic at the same time? I've maintained from the very beginning of this trial, and I think my, my life and record will show that in the gods, and that the charge of atheism is untrue. I rather 
like the point that was made, um, well, I liked all the points that were made by my defense team. But, uh, I like the point that was made that uh, Socrates, uh, in terms of this earth, doesn't um, wonder about the things above the earth or beneath the earth. I'm concerned about character and good in human beings. And if that purpose is not the same as what the gods would have, then I would have another mystery to investigate, another riddle to investigate. Thank you. Sure, thank you. On your current statement you just made, the gods would have sent you on a mission to corrupt the Jewish Perplexing question, which means, of course, I don't know the answer. Um, so, your question is if the gods had sent me on a mission to corrupt the youth, would I have done that? Um, I, I think if the gods were to send me on such a mission, it would be another riddle of the type I was given that Socrates is the wisest man. If the gods say, Socrates, you should go out and corrupt the youth, then uh, I would I would take that on as a riddle, not as an order. So at this point, did you have any intention at all in the corruption of the youth? Absolutely not. How many citizens have questions for me? I will let the questioning go on, and that means we will keep the closing arguments very brief, but I think it's vitally important that the citizens get to interact with this opportunity, so we won't be able to question you all. Thank you for that, Mary. I thank you for the opportunity. Socrates, you say that um, your, soul, your goal was to find good character, is that correct? You define yourself as having good character? Mm, it would be, I think, uh, well, yes, absolutely. Well, then my question to you would be, if you define good character in your behavior, then how would you consider having your wife and your children live in poverty, a man of good character? Why would you not provide for your children and for your wife and for your family? Why would you require the state to take care of your family as opposed to take care of yourself? Unfortunately, it was the gods who set me on this charge to set me loose on this task. And I have had to set everything else aside to fulfill it, including my family. And to them, I offer my apologies. Uh, but uh, if you convict me, I want you to be rough on my sons in my absence, which may give you an idea where I'm coming from on my family. You accept no responsibility for your own actions and for their oh, I, I know full well that philosophizing has a heavy, heavy price. You just stated that it was the act of the gods who sent you on this quest. You were, you were shirking your responsibility. I'm going to say. I don't see how. I mean, I've dedicated my entire life to this uh, charge of seeking a wise man encouraging much anger and impoverishing my family as a byproduct. <clears throat> but the quest is larger than any of those things. Maybe defense uh, talk to the prosecution? I Is wish you would. Oh, I'm out of the turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, you question um, <clears throat> why would he be his family? That is one that's and this just proves his belief in God and that he's not an atheist. I guess he would leave his family in pursuit of the God's will or God's way, which you are proving that he does in fact believe in God's I, I want to make that one. I should maybe make a question. I, I don't know. think that's a question, your magistrate. <laughs> that's a state that he's made. And Socrates has already told us that there are no wise men, so all the wise I know the citizen there on the end has been trying to get the... Oh yeah, I got a question. I got a few questions. Socrates, much like many Athenians, 
It is rumored that you are bisexual. Is this true? <laughs> what does that have to do with Well, anything? against the corruption of youth and the allegation that has been brought up, Miletus has claimed that you have fornicated with some students. That, that is a false charge. Of course, that's what they all say. But let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. In my entire career with young people, I have never once taken money from them. I have never once used a young person for my own means, towards my own ends, whether bisexual or not, I would I have never in all my career had sexual relations with any student. I rest my case. Is there anyone who has a question who has not yet spoken to the question and the answer? I can take one or two more and then Let's just go around this. You speak of the difference between a rule of one and a rule of many. They're tyranny, so to speak. But is there a difference if the rule of one is bent up by thousands? Here you are, corrupting the youth, money disappearing, you portray yourself as a man of poverty. Wouldn't it be a coincidence of all these things to play your team together and you know, play? And wouldn't it be a coincidence if Athens became a dictatorship with one rule? And wouldn't it be a coincidence if that one rule was you? I, I have to remind you, and the rest, and the magistrate, I have to remind you that the entire court that when it came time, for me to enter politics, when I had the opportunity to enter politics myself as Socrates, I refused. And the reason I refused was I could not do politics and philosophy at the same time and not be critical to philosophy. So I am not that tyrant. And never would be because of my personal and philosophical dislike of politics. I think we have one final comment in the question and answer period, and then we will go to closing comments. Um, thank you, uh, Magistrate. Um, my question is to the Magistrate is uh, you spoke of um, being a rational society, but uh, rationality is not of uh, logic and law. Um, so, is that meaning is like Socrates' view of logic in, the, in, in our society now, he just, is he not just trying to uh, express his logic terms and, and view that in the, our society is not living logically? So to put Socrates to death is not to, is not because of putting him to death because we fear the wisdom that he's spreading? I do believe we are actually entering closing arguments. <laughs> We have had a couple of uh, closing arguments. <laughs> Socrates can answer his understanding of the functioning of the Athenian society. So if you wish to take a brief comment to that comment, you may, and otherwise we will go to closing arguments. Reason is reason. Now, that is a tautology, and as philosophers, you should suspect such repetitive language as being a circular argument. But reason and logic stand on their own merits. I do not understand how reason, if properly used, could be a detriment to a character as myself or could be a detriment to the state. It is the same reason that we all rely on for the operation of the law and philosophy and the conduct of human affairs. Thank you. We will now have brief closing statements, and because we did extend the question and answer interaction, I will ask 
one member on each team. You may rise and stand in place, take a minute or two to make your final closing remarks about the Athenian citizenry and decide what to do with this philosophy. Madam Magistrate, citizens of Athens, and honorable guests, um, you have before you Socrates, a man who is an intellectual. If that's not enough to give you, give you concern, uh, I will give you this. Socrates has, uh, is a very witty man. He's a very uh, clever man. Socrates laughs up his sleeve at all the world. While we sit here and listen to him tell us that he cares nothing, cares nothing about politics, cares nothing about the way the world is run, and yet he lives off of the goodwill of all of you people. He says, I live in rags, his rope doesn't look that bad to me. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not glorious, but it's a, it's a functioning robe. He has three children, he, he has a home, um, we've taken care of him. Uh, and yet he's, yet he's laughing at us behind his back. Huh? We've all heard the 30 tyrants, the friends that he tried to help put into power and they failed and they've been run out into another city and they're living elsewhere. Why don't you go join them, Socrates? Why are you here today? He's here today to make fun of all of you. I say, put this man where he belongs, put him in jail or put him to death. Defense closing argument from May I ask we split the defense into two shorter brief statements? Uh, well, let's see, are you team one or team two? We're team two. Let's get team one. Okay, let's get, let's get them to go. Okay. People of Athens, we are tired of fighting. Been through war. Some of us don't understand why. We need to point a finger. Socrates is here today lifting up your system of free democracy, allowing you to decide. He's not running, he's not hiding. If I could put your attention on the opening statements of the opening prosecutor. And I quote, we would like to press on him the charge of corruption. We would like to press on him the charge of atheism. And that's exactly what's happening today. Our society was not built on ignorance, but of knowledge. And the defendant here is only spreading knowledge. Thank you. <laughs> Is the prosecution getting another turn? You, we have left one closing argument from prosecution oh. and team two, and one closing statement from defense team two. So, so every yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. I wasn't sure that was out of order there, I guess. All right. Magistrate, people of Greece, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Socrates, let us reason together. The accusations in front of you are impiety corrupting the youth of Athens and of Greece. Your views, your wisdom, are at odds with all that Greece stands for, our faith and our way of governments. It's the foundation of the greatness of Athens and Greece. Currently, Greece is the greatest nation, greatest known force in the world. Our culture and our military is the mightiest and the strongest in the known world. And the Athenian Navy, even though we had our defeat to the Peloponnesian War, the Athenian Navy, we let's not forget, defeated the Persian Navy, sending Xerxes back to Macedonia where his court belonged. You yourself are a veteran of many battles, and decorated so. Which, which is more disturbing to me and to this panel today, as a man of your military service, serving in your country, Greece, and Athens, and you would turn you on your own faith and turn on your own country. You profess a single ruler style of government, a king or a dictator. From your past, we know that that has not worked. I don't know what you would compare that thinking to currently, what would, what would be better than a representative style of government. You have 
uh, our youth live in a time of great prosperity and blessings. From Zeus, who has blessed all of us, and you challenge all the Greek stands for. Why? You promote the idea of one God. You probably learned this from the Hebrew king, King Solomon, the wisest man of his day. So where is that king? Where is the Hebrew people? They are dust in the wind. You should read his own writings. Proverbs 11.14 says, For lack of guidance, the nation falls, but many advisors make a victory sure. Zeus has many guides to assist him. He would never have any rest if he didn't have Apollo directing the sun, Poseidon watching the oceans, and Aphrodite attending to love. The examples of Zeus is further proof that representative government works, and that a strong foundation for Greece is founded in a representative government. Your teaching, Socrates, are corrosion to that foundation of Greece, and they are poison to the ears of the youth. Your rejection of all things Greek is hypocrisy itself. You live in Greek society, you have prospered in Greek society, and you, you reject it all now, and your actions are treason to Greece. You are similar to a viper that enters a market and causes harm to the people there. The viper needs to be killed, it does not poison anyone else.
This is the death cup. This it has us going cross <laughs> <laughs> one It is one of the ugliest cups that's ever been really made in a ceramics class. <laughs> the horrible colored, icky, pukey glaze. How perfect for that is that? So, you know, we are prepared. I see Socrates is holding. Thank <laughs> you. 